Hi, good morning. My name is Wes, one of the pastors. Excited to be with you as well and share some time together in God's Word, what we do each Sunday. We'll look at a passage from God's Word. We'll talk about what it means and why it matters and what we should do about it. So if you have a Bible with you, a Bible app, uh, even the Bible under the seat in front of you, if you would turn to our passage today, Genesis 16. Genesis 16, beginning at verse 1, and when you found that, if you're able, if you would stand together with me in honor of the reading of God's Word. Here we read this. Now, and for the record, this is pre-name uh, change for Abraham and Sarah. So we've got Sarai and Abram. I'm going to just jump ahead in the story, if you'll permit me, to just call them Abraham and Sarah. So don't be confused by that. Now, Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children, but she had an Egyptian slave named Hagar. So she said to Abraham, the Lord has kept me from having children. Go, sleep with my slave. Perhaps I can build a house through her. Abraham agreed to what Sarah said. So Abraham had been living in Canaan for 10 years. Sarah, his wife, took her Egyptian slave Hagar and gave her to her husband to be his wife. He slept with Hagar and she conceived. And when she knew she was pregnant, she began to despise her mistress. Then Sarah said to Abraham, you are responsible for the wrong I am suffering. I put my slave in your arms and now that she knows she's pregnant, she despises me. May the Lord judge between you and me. Your slave is in your hands, Abraham said. Do with her whatever you think best. And then Sarah mistreated Hagar, so she fled from her. And the angel of the Lord found Hagar near a spring in the desert. It was the spring that is beside the road to Shur. And he said, Hagar, slave of Sarah, where have you come from and where are you going? I'm running away from my mistress, Sarah, she answered. Then the angel of the Lord told her, go back to your mistress and submit to her. The angel added, I will increase your descendants so much that they will be too numerous to count. The angel of the Lord also said to her, you are now pregnant and you will give birth to a son and you shall name him Ishmael, for the Lord has heard your misery. He will be a wild donkey of a man and his hand will be against everyone and everyone's hand against him and he will live in hostility toward all his brothers. And she gave this name to the Lord who spoke to her, You are the God who sees me. For she said, I have now seen the one who sees me. That is why the well was called Bir Laha Roy, which means the well of the God who sees me. It is still there between Kadesh and Bered. So Hagar bore Abraham a son. And, she, and Abraham gave him the name Ishmael to the son that she had born. Abraham was 86 years old when Hagar bore him Ishmael. That's God's word. You may be seated. Let me pray for us quickly, and then we'll dive into this passage together. Spirit of God, I ask that you would come now by your spirit and speak powerfully to us through your word as we come to you to hear from you, to receive from you. God, I trust that you have a purpose and uh, exact task that you want to accomplish in each one of us through your word. You tell us whenever you send it out, it doesn't return to you void. It accomplishes the purpose for which you sent it. Oh God, accomplish that purpose in each one of us today. As I always ask now, eternal God, would you move and govern my tongue to speak your truth? Amen. Well, it was May 8th. 2019 when physical therapist and yoga instructor Amanda Eller set out on a hike into the 2,000 acre Makawao Forest Reserve in Maui with and wandering off the path at one point during her journey she quickly found herself disoriented and unable to find her way back to the path a costly mistake that extended for hours that then extended into days, that then extended into weeks, being unable to find the path or unable to be found. Uh, four days into this whole uh, ordeal, Amanda would fall 20 feet, breaking her left tibia. Uh, she survived on nothing but berries and guava for the whole time she was lost and so damaged her feet. Uh, apparently a day after breaking her leg, she lost her shoes in a flash flood. 
so damaged her feet during this whole ordeal that by the time she finally was rescued, they nearly needed to be amputated. Wandering, really hobbling through the forest reserve, uh, alone, afraid, uh, Amanda had but one great need, to be seen by someone and, and rescued from the consequences of her decision. A need it would take a full 17 days and over a thousand volunteers in order for that need to be met when late one afternoon, uh, May 24th, one of the helicopters spotted Amanda near the top of a waterfall and returned her safely home. That's a picture, next one there, of the crew as they found her, kind of a proof of life pick, like, hey, we got her. So we are continuing in our summer teaching series that we began last week entitled Hidden Figures, a title, as I mentioned, borrowed from a 2016 book, later turned film, that highlights the story of three young black female mathematicians working for NASA, NACA during the 60s, who, whose contributions essentially helped America win the space race against Russia, but whose stories largely remain hidden because of the strong gender and racial discrimination during their day. And the whole point of this series, then, borrowing from that same idea, is to highlight the stories of women in the Bible. Stories that are essential to the gospel narrative and which reveal the nature and character of God himself, but that also remain hidden, at least to some degree, due to the, as we saw last week, kind of just the patriarchal context in which they occur. Uh, a balance, which I'm hoping to try and correct through the course of this series, at least even in the smallest of degrees that we're going to do here. And I bring up that story of Amanda Eller because, in my view, her experience is not dissimilar from the hidden figure that we're looking at today from our passage in Genesis 16, this young Egyptian maidservant by the name of Hagar. Now, no, Hagar is not out on a hike uh, in any sense of the word, and she's essentially fleeing for her life. And as far as socioeconomic status, the two could not be more different. And yet, what Amanda and Hagar both have in common is a need that I believe every single person in this room also shares with them. The need to be seen. The need to be seen. And what our passage today reveals is a God who absolutely meets that need for Hagar and by implication is also able to meet that need for you and for me today. That he is a God who, who sees when it seems like no one else on earth sees. He sees and sees with compassion, sees in, in a way that is able to move his heart to action, to rescue and to redemption. In order to help you see that too and grasp that incredible reality that's shown to us from the story of Hagar, I want to look at our passage today in just two simple ways. We're going to talk about God's redemptive sight of Hagar and then God's contrasting sight of Hagar, which I'll explain what I mean when we get there. God's redemptive sight and his contrasting sight of Hagar. So if you close your Bibles, your Bible app, whatever you're using, could you open it again with me to that passage? Follow along with me as we look today now at revealing the hidden figure of Hagar. So let's look first of all here at God's redemptive sight of Hagar. God's redemptive sight, in which in order to really see and understand from Hagar's story, you need to understand the broader context in which it occurs, which Genesis sets up for us there in verse 1 of our passage. Look with me there. Here we read, Now Sarah, Abraham's wife, had borne him no children. That sets the context for us here. It's an important piece of information for a number of reasons. First of all, because what you see in the story of Abraham leading up to this moment is God's promise to Abraham to make him into a nation as numerous as the stars in the sky by providing a flesh and blood heir through Sarah. And yet, as we see in verse 3, 10 years have passed since that promise without Sarah. Sarah still has not become pregnant. So she still has not borne Abraham a son, but it's also important information because secondly, because of what having children meant for a woman in this ancient Near Eastern context. 
Like, what did that mean for her? This is important. Again, the thing to remember in this context and time in history is what it, this meant is that if you're a woman, um, having children, like your main purpose in life, as Sarah states there at the end of verse 2, is to build a home. That's your main purpose and value in life, to build a home, that is, to enable your husband to carry on his family line by having children. Uh, uh, if, if you have them, um, children are, are, as one commentator said, basically uh, they're a woman's capital. They're her significance. If you have them, you're blessed by God, you're, you're honoring to your husband. If you don't have them, you're cursed, uh, dishonoring to your family. Now, and just to be very clear, I'm not recommending this uh, viewpoint of women or children. I'm, I'm not saying that that's right or good. I'm simply just stating that's the context in which Hagar's story occurs. But knowing that context now helps us to better understand both the impatience of Sarah with God's promise as well as her proposed solution to the problem, which we see there in verse 2. Look, that she will give her Egyptian maidservant Hagar to Abraham as a wife to build her family, that is, fulfill her culturally mandated purpose through her. Which, yes, okay, 100%, I know that in our modern 21st century context, we read something like that, I'm just like, sorry, what? Um, sounds strange uh, at best and horrific at worst, like a complete violation of someone's human rights, as Hagar is essentially treated like nothing more than like a uterus on loan through which Sarah can achieve, her, alleviate her shame, alleviate her, her impatience with God. What's also important to know, uh, within this framework of a surrogate system of birth here. Once Hagar gives birth to the child, she will belong to Sarah, not to Hagar. So this is like straight out of the handmaid's tale. Like that's what we're reading here. This is literally what's going on here. The, the baby now belongs to Sarah. But again, this seems strange, horrific to us. And yet what scholars and historians all agree is that in this time and in this culture, this is entirely normal. This is accepted by everyone. In some cases, it's, it's even like uh, legally required. So the point is, it just seems weird, worrisome to us. Didn't seem at all weird and worrisome to Abraham and Sarah. But as we read on in the second half of verse 4, look, we see that the plan quickly blows up in Sarah's face. As once she becomes pregnant, Hagar begins to look down on Sarah she begins to despise her. Literal translation here is that her mistress looked little to her. And we're not told exactly what that looked like, but my guess is that the offense that we see Sarah bringing to Abraham later in verse 5 is both real and perceived. That is, like Hagar does become proud and, and insolent in her ability to do what Sarah cannot. And Sarah's sensitivity around the issue of being able to conceive is like cranked up to 11. And so maybe in one sense, like everything Hagar does feels like another dig at her. But all of which, just in both directions, really just highlights it's just the necessary and painful res result of telling anyone your purpose and value is wrapped up in this thing. Just telling anyone that. that that's, this is what happens when you do that. Um, having children being the primary breadwinner in your home, uh, getting good grades, uh, ignoring uh, family dysfunction. These are the things that give you worth and value if you can do that. It's just, it's just a recipe for disaster, a recipe for either heartbreak or the prideful looking down on another person. And sadly, when Sarah brings this hurt, brings this injustice to her husband, he abandons his responsibility to Hagar and to her entirely. It just passes the buck entirely on both of them. As one commentator put it, essentially he tells Sarah, hey, she's your employee, not mine. This, this isn't my department. Uh, do with her whatever you think seems right. And as a result, man, the, the gloves really come off. And I think all of Sarah's internal hurt and shame at not being able to conceive now is poured out in unbridled violence on Hagar. We're not told exactly what she did, but the Bible just simply says, right, that she mistreated Hagar. But as you see at the end of verse 6, it's severe enough that Hagar is like fleeing for her life through the desert with child on a break for her homeland back to Egypt. That's, 
what those landmarks kind of tell us where she's headed. She's headed back to Egypt. In fact, the Hebrew word mistreated there is the same word used later in Exodus for how Pharaoh and the Egyptians treated the Israelites. So it's, it's bad, whatever it is. But now it's here. Beaten, abused, with child, and wandering through the desert, fleeing for her life. Look at verse 7. says, God meets Hagar. He finds her near a spring in the desert, revealing, look, both his knowledge of her suffering as well as the blessing that he intends to pour out on her. Now, no, much like uh, numerous other times in the Old Testament when God shows up and reveals himself to a person, this exact language of the angel of the Lord is used. So even in places like Moses and the burning bush, uh, Jacob wrestling the angel, we, we hear that language. It means God himself has shown up to meet with this person. She doesn't know initially, just like those other figures. She doesn't realize initially that it's the Lord, which suggests he's, he's shown up in a form that's not surprising to her. Maybe it's human form, we don't know, but he's shown up in a way that she doesn't initially recognize this presence is divine. And yet, following the prophecy that God speaks regarding her son there in verses 11 and 12, the reality is that this is a divine presence. It now becomes undeniable to her, causing her to name God, as we see there in verse 13, you are the God who sees me. Turn the Hebrew is El Roy, uh, not to be confused with El Roy. El Roy is, you are the God who sees me, which is notable for a number of reasons, um, not least of which, as Bruce Waltke notes in his work on this passage, this is the only instance in the Bible, he says, where a human being is represented as conferring a name on God. It's the only time it happens in the Bible. It's also notable because what we see is that the one person conferring a name on God is not even one of God's covenant people. She's, she's a foreigner living among God's people, and she's the one who confers this name on God. You're the God who sees me. And yet somehow in being seen by God, given the knowledge that he sees her oppression, it hasn't gone unnoticed, and he is inclined towards her. Look, it gives her the strength, the ability to return to her mistress, now unmistakably under the eye and protection of God, she knows now he sees what's going on. He's with me. God is essentially now the husband to her that Abraham declined to be. And she bears a son for Abraham. So we read that. And obviously, like, Hagar's need to be seen, it's, it's different. It's different from Amanda's, lost in the dense forests of Maui. But it's different in a way that I think is relatable to infinitely more people. Because regardless of the circumstances of where it happens, who among us doesn't know the redemptive hope you feel when maybe, maybe it's you who's experienced injustice yourself? Maybe you know someone who is currently experiencing that? You, maybe you know what it feels like to feel powerless, like Hagar, where the strong exercise their dominance over you, trade you with other powerful people like a commodity? Don't you know the transforming power to know in the midst of that injustice that someone knows and sees what's going on? It's not just happening in this like darkness. There's no accountability. Like it's seen and understood. And, and, and someone sees the injustice and is committed to intervening for you. I think that's the very first way that, that Hagar's story helps us to see God's redemptive sight of us. Beyond all that, I think there's also another redemptive hope in we seeing that God is just simply aware of us at all. Think about that. God comes to find Hagar wandering in the desert just to know that the God of the universe, infinite in power and majesty and holiness, he's aware of you. He sees you. He knows you intimately and individually, and he's inclined towards you. It's a powerful, transforming reality that's described for us in places like Psalm 8, where David says this, When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have set in place, what is man that you are mindful of him, the son of man that you care for him? This is the experience that, that Hagar is having in this moment, that God of the universe, he sees me, and it's powerfully transforming for her. 
Because here's the thing, actually, overall, that's just so powerful about Hagar's story and her naming of God as, you are the God who sees me. Amanda Eller, she, she needed someone to see her because she was lost and needed rescuing, right? But Hagar, think about her. She has no expe- expectation of being seen whatsoever, right? Just think about that. She's not running away into the desert hopeful of some interaction with God. She's not going out there to be seen or hopeful or by God or anyone for that matter. And in fact, she's running away because she's not seen. She's not seen as, as a, just a, a human being with dignity and value and worth. She's treated instead like nothing more than a possession, a tool, the means by which someone else's hopes and dreams will be fulfilled, valuable solely for what she can achieve for somebody else, provide for somebody else. That's her whole value and worth. And to anyone who's ever felt like that too, God's message to you and to me today through the story of Hagar is, I see you. I see you. Even when it seems like nobody else in the whole world right now does, I see you. And you have worth and dignity and value to me. Which exactly like it did for Hagar, I think that that gives us strength and ability to enter back into situations and into hard circumstances because now you go with the knowledge of your inestimable value and worth that's not dependent now on anyone else. It's granted from like outside of that sphere by God himself and therefore cannot be taken away by anyone either. Okay, so much more we could say about that. It's a transforming reality from Hagar's story. Honestly, I'd love to just sit in all day, but that's, that's the redemptive sight, God's redemptive sight of Hagar. Last thing I want to look at together with you now is God's comparative sight of Hagar, or his contrasting sight of Hagar. So let me just explain what I mean by that, because what we find as we continue to read through the scripture is that there's something else revealed to us in the story of Hagar and Sarah that is actually like completely separate from her story, in, from her individual story. It happens alongside, but it, it doesn't actually touch what we read about in Hagar's story. And it's revealed to us in contrasting Hagar and her child, Ishmael, with Sarah and the child that she eventually bears, Isaac. Because when we come to the New Testament letter of Paul to the church at Rome, to the, to, uh, sorry, to the church at Galatia, and if you've ever read Galatians before, you already know that that's a, a book or a letter that's all about contrasting salvation by works, salvation by obedience to the law, and salvation by grace alone. When we read this interesting application, which is drawn from our passage in Genesis 16, where, listen, where Paul writes this. He says, Tell me, you who want to be under the law... Are you not aware of what the law says? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, one by the slave woman and the other by the free woman. His son by the slave woman was born according to the flesh, but his son by the free woman was born as a result of a divine promise. These things are being taken figuratively. The women represent two covenants. One covenant is from Mount Sinai and bears children who are slaves. This is Hagar. Now, Hagar stands from Mount Sinai in Arabia and corresponds to the present city of Jerusalem because she is in slavery with her children. That is, slavery to the law. But the Jerusalem that is above is free, and she is our mother. For it is written, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. What's going on there? <laughs> what's, what's that about? Let, great question. Let, let's unpack this a bit. Go back now with me to Genesis 16, and let's just kind of trace those same details through this new lens that Paul gives us in Galatians. So immediately before our passage, this is where Abraham, he's really struggling with how God's going to come through on the promise. 
to give him uh, a child, how he's going to make him into a nation as numerous as the stars in the sky. And, and, and since he and his wife remain childless, and so he proposes a plan to God. He's like, you know what? I'm going to take a servant in my house and make him my heir. This guy, uh, Eliezer of Damascus. So he says, that, that's, how that's the only way this is going to work out, God. And God says to him in reply this, this man will not be your heir. But a son who is your own flesh and blood will be your heir. And he took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars, if indeed you can count them. Then he said to him, so shall your offspring be. And Abraham, it says, believed the Lord, and it was credited to him as righteousness. Okay, this is what we looked at a few weeks ago in the Origin of Covenant, in our origin story series. But as you see, when we get to our passage now in chapter 16, while Abraham, okay, he's believing the Lord, Credited to him as righteousness. He's trusting in God's promise to deliver. Sarah, not so much, right? She's not. In fact, as you see there in verse 2, she blames God for her childlessness. It's the Lord who has kept me from bearing children. Imagine that. The one who has promised to give her a child, she says, you're the one preventing me from having a child. So therefore then, consider, what is Sarah's proposed plan to build a family through Hagar, but her impatience? Really, her unbelief in God's promise and then trying to bring about the promise in her own strength, right? She doesn't want, I don't want to wait anymore. Who knows if it's going to happen? I'm going to work it out in my own strength. In fact, what numerous commentators pointed out is that the way you read in in chapter 16 about Abraham listening to the voice of his wife instead of listening to the voice of God, as well as the specific language that you have in verse 3 and 4 where Sarah took her Egyptian slave, and gave it to her husband, and he slept with her. They point directly back to the fall in Genesis 3, where we read about Eve. She took the forbidden fruit, gave it to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. That The language is meant to almost be like a rerun of the story of the fall. And while the consequences of their faithless actions are not as severe as what we saw in Genesis 3, without question, their efforts to achieve the promise by their own human means, bring about disorder, disaster, and disappointment for everyone. Everyone loses in this, in, in this, in this exchange. In his own work on this passage, Tim Keller, he, he ties together the Genesis account with Paul's analogy in Galatians masterfully, noting this. So in front of Abraham is whether he wants to save himself through grace or save himself through works whether he wants to save himself through his own human ability or completely rely on supernatural grace. That's the choice in front of Abraham. And because he decided to save himself, the immediate results were pain and disaster. And as Keller goes on to say, that's always true. Always. (laughs) Whenever we have those choices in front of us and we choose instead, no, I'm going to try to fix it myself, do it myself. The results are always the same, pain and disaster. And yet, as we read on in the story, we see that God's promise, it's not thwarted because of their faithless actions. They do, eventually, Sarah does, miraculously give birth to a son, Isaac, through whom God's promise uh, that all the nations of the world will be blessed happens through him as it's through Isaac's line that eventually Jesus comes. So he is faithful. He He had a plan and a purpose and timing that he would fulfill. They just simply couldn't wait for it. But this is precisely why Paul includes that quote from Isaiah 54 after contrasting salvation by works, obedience to the law symbolized by Hagar, and salvation by grace symbolized by Sarah's miraculous conception of Isaac, where he writes again, Be glad, barren woman, you who never bore a child. Shout for joy and cry aloud, you who were never in labor, because more are the children of the desolate woman than of her who has a husband. He writes that because although God does promise Hagar that her descendants will be too numerous to count, just as he does to Abraham, notice he doesn't also say to her, and through you all the nations of the world will be blessed. There's no promise attached to it like there is to Abraham and Sarah. And therefore, the children of the barren woman, that is Sarah, are greater than the one who has a husband. That is, she who's able to bear children naturally, which is meaning Hagar. As I said, none of this is intended to take away from all the goodness that we just saw 
in, in Hagar's story, the redemptive seeing of Hagar. It's not meant to take away from any of that. But the contrasting of Hagar's and Sarah's stories do invite us to answer an important question as it relates to the promises of God to us. Namely, in what or in whom is my trust when it comes to God's promise of salvation? Or for that matter, in anything that God's promised to me? In what or in whom am I trusting? Am I trusting in God and in His grace alone that He will be faithful to accomplish what He's promised? Or am I trying to bring about the fulfillment of His promise on my own, by my own means? Because, man, like if you look again at God's promise to Abraham to give him a flesh and blood child, it's in no way ambiguous, is it? There's no kind of like, well, does he mean, like maybe it's, like it's really clear what he says to him. And in fact, when Abraham offers that counterproposal, hey, I'll, I'll adopt one of these slaves in my house, he'll become my heir. God's like, nope, that's not how I'm going to do it. I'm going to give you a flesh and blood heir of your son, your son of your own. Trust me to wait for the fulfillment of the promise. And then he brings him out right into the starry sky. Look, that's how many your offspring are going to be, if you can even count them. And yet in choosing to attain a child through Hagar instead of waiting for God's promise, what Abraham and Sarah were doing was essentially saying, God, I don't think you can be trusted to accomplish what you promised. I'm, I'm going to need to help you out. I'm going to need to take this into my own hands and help your promise be fulfilled by my own means. So now, thinking about that, now think about the promise of salvation to you in Jesus' own words where he says, we just sang this this morning, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. The gift of God. Free. Just belief is all that's required. Or Paul's instruction later in Ephesians 2, for it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. Right? In no way ambiguous. Kind of like, well, maybe, maybe I, I, I need to help out in some way there. No, it's the gift of God, the grace of God. That's it, right? Just like his promise of a son to Abraham. The promise of salvation here, not ambiguous at all. And yet, in spite of its clarity, in spite of the clarity of God's promise and the clear need to just trust in God, His grace alone, and, and believe that He will be faithful to accomplish what He's promised, what many of us reveal by our lives, by our behavior, and, and even in the things that we fear is an abandoning of the gospel message, or at least like a forgetfulness of it, and seeking instead to try and accomplish our salvation by means of our own efforts. I think that's what many times, whether we would say it or not, that's what our lives reveal. Like you see it all kinds of different ways. I think it reveals himself, for instance, whenever I feel like God is more pleased with me, God is more accepting of me when I'm doing all the good stuff. Man, when I read my Bible, when I'm praying, when I'm coming to church, giving tithes, like God's pleased with me then, and then he's displeased with me. God is even rejecting of me when I don't do those things. Or when I do the opposite of those things, now I'm rejected by God. That's, a, that's, that's an abandonment of the gospel, which says it's by grace alone, through faith alone. Whenever um, my obedience to God is characterized by, by a dutiful obligation, rather than just grateful, joy-filled gratitude. Whenever I'm, I'm looking down on someone else, when they look little in my eyes because my ability to keep the rules is superior to them, all of those things, it's the same thing. I'm, I'm substituting in, I'm showing by my life, I'm not just trusting in the grace of God to save me. There's these other things that I need to do now in order to help God, in order to make him pleased with me. Which if you didn't know, this whole idea of Forgetting the gospel of salvation by grace and returning to a salvation by works alone, that's exactly what Paul was critiquing in his letter to the Galatians. That's what the, almost the whole letter is about. 
For although they too had been saved by grace alone through faith in Jesus, they were returning to a works-based system, a law-based system, seeking to earn through their own efforts what was only available to them in Jesus. Paul's plea to them again and again is, no, don't do that. He says to them, very next chapter, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Don't go back to the old system of trying to earn. It's already being earned for you. Which is why he says to all who trust in Christ for the promise of salvation, a verse earlier, he says, for we are not children of the slave woman, but of the free woman. So, two deeply important truths revealed to us in the story of Hagar that will be lost to us if the story were to remain hidden. One, revealing the nature and character of God. The other, a contrast to the hope of the gospel that reminds us to trust in Him alone, to wait on Him for what He's promised. I don't know, I would love to just like talk with each person afterwards, but I wonder which one of those two truths the, the Spirit knew that you needed to hear this morning and drawing you to be part of this gathering? For some who know the powerlessness of Hagar, the invisibility of Hagar all too well, maybe my prayer is for you that your heart is already being like defibrillated, spiritually speaking, by just the knowledge that maybe, maybe the, the, in the same way that God saw Hagar, maybe he sees me too. For others, maybe the contrast of Hagar's story to Sarah has reminded you of God's faithfulness to his promise. He will be faithful and revealed places where you know you too have been impatient with God's timing and you've been trying to bring about in your own means and in your own efforts what is already yours in Jesus. Whatever it is, I want to take some time now as we do each Sunday to sit in silence before God, to reflect on what it is that He has revealed to us in His Word, allow His Spirit to speak to your heart directly and specifically as it relates to what He is calling you to now in response to what is revealed. So let's take some time to do that together, and then in a few moments, we'll take the Lord's Supper together.